Welcome to today's event, uh, at which Oxial will announce a world first, the capability for unlimited low-cost production of single-wall carbon nanotubes, a breakthrough which will have a similar impact on manufacturing as Google did on the internet. The schedule for today's event is as, as follows. Yuro Korapachinsky, president of Oxial, will explain some background and context to this revolutionary breakthrough. Yuri has a strong track record of establishing and running businesses in tech and production, being a successful investor with proven managerial skills. Prior to his business career, Yuri was involved in scientific research, working for the Siberian branch of the Academy of Science of the USSR. Yuri launched his first venture company in the early 1990s. After a very successful exit from one of his investments um, in 2004, a farm machinery business, which grew to become a company with $230 million turnover and 20,000 employees. He set up an industrial investment structure, SM Group, which funds promising high-tech startups, and since 2012 has focused on carbon nanomaterials. This led to the creation of Oxial. Yuri will be followed by Mikhail Pretachinsky, Chief Technology Officer of Oxial, an inventor of the new technology, who will explain the synthesis method. Mikhail is an acknowledged specialist in the areas of synthesis of nanomaterials, energetics, mechanics, thermal physics, and plasma physics. His key inventions include the plasma chemical reactor, the solder jet technology, a method of coal preparation, solid oxide, oxide fuel cells, and others. Mikhail is a graduate of the Novosibirsk Electronic, uh, Electrotechnical Institute and is a doctor of physical and mathematical sciences a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He is the author of more than 200 scientific publications and patents. He's advised on technology uh, issues at companies such as Hewlett Packard, Samsung, and Air Products and Chemicals. Mm -hmm. Yuri will then conclude the presentation by outlining, outlining the vast market for graphene nanotubes and their application across multiple sectors and industries. The presentation will take around one hour and will be followed by a Q&A session. Um, as I sort of briefly said earlier, the event will be recorded, so please wait for the microphone before you ask the question. Please state your name and the name of your organization. Uh, both the presentation and the Q&A sessions will be translated, headphones are provided. Hopefully we've all uh, tried to, to, to make them work. Uh, you've, you've tried them on, you've turned the power on, you've turned them to the right channel, you've adjusted the volume, um, and they all hopefully work very well. Following the Q&A session, lunch, champagne, and drinks, um, will be available in the library, which is across on the other side, and there's also a display in there which will further explain and showcase uh, some of the applications of this technology. Loos are on the ground floor for gents, ladies are in the basement, uh, fire escapes are at either end of this, the corridor joining these two rooms, the library in here, um, and, uh, 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 <coughs> and, finally before, sorry, and finally before I kick off, I wanted to introduce the rest of the Oxial team who are in the room today, and if they could just give a wave um, when I read their names, um, hopefully without pronouncing them too badly. Um, Oleg uh, Kirillov, who is the CEO um, and Oxial Group, uh, Oxial Group and co-founder of the business. Uh, Yuri Zlevinsky, uh, co-founder of Oxial. Uh, Max Atanasov, who is the CEO of Oxial USA. Uh, Vladimir Perakoti, who is the creative vice president for Oxial. Arshot Teravanasov, who is the European CEO. Ksenia Kulgaeva, who is the communications manager uh, for Oxial. Bernd Runge, who is the VP of business development uh, in Europe, who is based in Berlin. Uh, Hans Linka, who is the application for application engineering Europe. Um, and so, without any further ado, Yuri. Thank you. Уважаемые леди и джентльмены, ladies and gentlemen, я счастлив привилегии выступать сегодня перед вами. Could everyone please put their heads, headsets on, whoever who wants to hear it in English? Sorry. Yuri is happy about this opportunity to be able uh, to present to you today. He would like to uh, tell you what inspired them, what we wanted to achieve and what we managed to achieve. 
would like to tell you about a wonderful technology which is uh, yeah, which you could use for almost anything. The first uh, significant achievement of this technology is the London's weather. You don't need to be grateful, it's just a small beginning. When we talk about something uh, on a huge scale, about, about When we, when we talk about uh, something on a scale, something that affects everyone, it's very, uh, it's very difficult to avoid cliches. It's uh, very difficult not to say some obvious things which uh, seem to be known to everyone. But still risk it and tell you a few of those things. And uh, try to look at it from a different point of view. Uh, in our eyes. What are um, the traits of what uh, is uh, the main thing about a particular historical uh, age? The first uh, period in history was called Stone Age. Creation of tools separated uh, men from uh, animals. Man got something that it, it didn't have uh, by birth, and that allowed uh, men to create permanent settlements, uh, start working with, uh, start farming, uh, and basically become a man. And uh, the main thing is the materials that allowed men to do this. The next age uh, is usually called the Bronze Age. It's uh, a very important uh, age in human's, man, uh, human's history. When man created a material which didn't exist in nature. Uh, man took uh, two metals which existed in nature. It was uh, copper and tin and created a third material which didn't exist before. It was bronze and it uh, was a lot harder. And finally, uh, man mastered iron. It happened approximately uh, in, in 13th century BC. And uh, it's uh, linked to the biggest catastrophe in uh, mankind's history which was caused uh, by technology. Maybe not everybody knows about this. It's uh, usually called the bronze collapse. During this time, most of ancient cities were destroyed. Uh, whole cultures disappeared and their languages disappeared as well. Ancient Greece uh, went into dark ages for 400 years. It was uh, linked to the fact that uh, making weapons out of iron it, uh, was a much uh, simpler process rather than making weapons out of bronze. And it allowed uh, to arm huge hordes of barbarians which pretty much destroyed the ancient world. In the middle of 19th century, in England, it was one of the most uh, important events uh, during uh, human history. Henry Bessemer, you, which uh, this particular institute in a, in a sense linked to, he created the first industrial method for steel production, so-called uh, Bessemer convector. It wasn't an isolated event. It was an event which started a whole chain of uh, further events, such as transatlantic shipping, because wooden ships, uh, they were very small, and steam engines took up all the space uh, in these ships, and they couldn't carry enough cargo and enough passengers. 
It was the creation of an internal combustion engine, electric motor. It was a boom in the railroad development. Steam engine was created almost 100 years before, but it didn't uh, lead, uh, lead to mass introduction of railroads. It, it had to do with the fact that uh, cast iron rails were uh, too fragile and they were breaking under the weight of steam engines. And only when cheap method for steel production was invented, uh, cheap rails allowed uh, to uh, create a railroad boom. And this was uh, linked to the development of U.S. At the same time, uh, reinforced concrete, concrete was invented and uh, patents uh, to build uh, bridges and skyscrapers. It's a very interesting historic photograph. It's one of the first skyscrapers in Manhattan. It's an office of a company uh, of sewing machines called Zynga. Hundred years ago, a co company Zynga was a, a huge uh, technology company, uh, just like Apple is now. It's a, a in creation of automobiles, which required petrol and uh, oil cracking uh, was invented as well. Uh, look at all these events. If you take out the, uh, the first st uh, step in the sequence, the whole uh, chain of events will uh, fall apart. Uh, it wouldn't be possible. You are saying that this whole wave of uh, scientific and technology revolution was defined by one material. It's still and one technology process. It's uh, usually called industrial revolution. And today, the companies in this industry sector are worth more than $9 trillion. And the, it's the largest uh, sector in the real uh, world's economy. Almost uh, just about 100 years after that, uh, three of these people, Grove, Noyce, and Moore, it's uh, the same person who invented Moore's law. They created a company called Intel. And uh, they also created a technology for producing microchips out of silicon. It's called a planar technology. So what were the consequences of this? Uh, PC was invented. First digital camera. Semiconductor lasers. Internet. All uh, technology waves have their key uh, engines. Uh, steam engine, internal combustion engine. They also had engine here, but uh, of a different kind. It was a search engine. iPod and MP3 players, social networks, and mobile internet. Because reckon that the iPhone is mobile inter internet, and this is a reason for its huge success. Uh, wouldn't be saying too much to say that Intel inside, if you take uh, the first event out, uh, nothing after that would, would have been possible. Just one material and one technology made it, uh, this technology wave possible. It's uh, usually called computer revolution, and this sector is now worth more than $5 trillion uh, uh, in stock prices, market cap capitalization. So is there a, a problem uh, that exists uh, with humanity right now, and what is uh, the need uh, for the humanity? And how they, will they define the next technological wave? Reckons if we answer to two of these questions, we will know what technology we need to search for. And uh, we asked this question uh, ourselves uh, four years ago, and want to tell you what uh, answer, we, answer we found. 
So I'll start from both of them, these issues, because threat and the need, uh, they were uh, closely linked together. Everybody heard about CO2 emissions. So I'm not talking about global warming at the moment, I'd like to highlight that, talking uh, about CO2 emissions. But I want to show you a few uh, figures, because I'm not sure that everybody knows about them and uh, actually understand that the real scale. In 94, humanity produced 3.3 gigatons of materials, consumed 11 billion tons of uh, fuel, and uh, emitted 18 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. 15 years after, 5, 18, and 30. I want to draw your attention to two things. First of all, it's a uh, uh, growth rate, 40 percent, maybe even, probably even more. And uh, one figure, uh, it's all materials in the world, humanity is producing between five and six billion tons. We are emitting 30 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, six, six times more than all the materials we see around us. So what will happen uh, over the next 15 years? Humanity increased, uh, the population increased by one billion compared to, compared to 94. And over the next 15 years, another billion people will be added. But even if you assume that the growth rate will be the same, these are the figures that we end up with. 40 billion tons of emissions of CO2, and we need to, to find 2 billion tons of materials from somewhere, uh, and they're the ones we don't produce at the moment. In reality, these numbers will be even higher. We looked through all uh, leading forecasts uh, in this particular area. Uh, the least that we could expect, it's doubling of uh, material and energy production over the next 30 to 35 years. So probably majority of uh, people in, in, in this room, uh, they will see this uh, moment and definitely all of our children will see it. Uh, so that we don't have any doubts. I want to show you data about CO2 emissions and want to highlight that this, it's not a scientific theory. It's a 100% uh, fact. Also want to show you uh, the growth of uh, um, material production over time. So zero is uh, year zero. You can see it's a pretty much vertical line which started growing in the uh, 20th century. If we uh, magnify that, uh, zoom into that particular fragment, that we'll see that since 1950, uh, production of materials grew uh, by the factor of 25. Usually people say you need alternative energy. Alternative, alternative energy, which is uh, not linked to CO2 emissions, will uh, make world green and uh, will supply everybody. Unfortunately, it's not possible. This is the uh, actual figures from very well known physicist. As Cesare Marchetti is still alive, he's Italian. This graph is very important and uh, I'd like to explain to you. This is time scale and this is types of fuel or electrical generation, electricity, uh, energy generation. It's not just ele electrical energy. Uh, and this is uh, their share. So the top line is 
Everything starts with uh, uh, green line. It's a uh, it's a biomass. It's a fuel. In, uh, uh, in 1800, it was more than 90 percent. The black is uh, coal. In 20s and 30s years, it was almost uh, 70 percent of all energy sources in the world. Uh, currently. There are three lines, coal, oil, and gas. They create, they're approximately the same, and it's uh, roughly one third of all energy sources. This is uh, nuclear energy. It's a very interesting example. You can see that this is the only one which was growing at a different rate. It has to do with the fact that uh, nuclear energy wasn't uh, developed by uh, business. It was developed by governments. It was developed by government of the largest and most powerful countries. Uh, what they achieved over, over 50 years? 5% in the uh, whole energy consumption of the humanity. All other non-emitting energy sources, it's a yellow line, they make up less than 1% of all energy generation in the world. So the question is, when this clean energy will become significant? Uh, by year 2050, it will be no more than 5%. Uh, it won't reach 50% uh, before uh, 2100. In other words, by the year 2050, energy, clean energy will not be able to change anything because we need to double uh, our energy production and uh, double the materials. Uh, it doesn't mean that we, have, we don't have to work on it. It's very important for the future. But it will not solve uh, any problems over the next 30 years. So what is the solution? Before I tell you about it, I just want to define again what is the issue and what is the need. The need is the energy and materials. The issue is the CO2 emissions. Today, it's 15% of the whole biosphere turnover, and it's too much not to destroy the balance. I'm not sure what the consequences are, and probably nobody knows. But uh, as a biologist and biophysicist by uh, education, I can tell you for sure, if something in a living system becomes a factor with a more than 15% weight, it will uh, irreversibly destroy the balance. So, so what is the solution? It's uh, ridiculously simple. Let's have a look at what we are surrounded, surrounded by. Most of materials, we are waste, uh, wasting them. Typical car is uh, 1.5 tons in weight. Four people, it's at most uh, 400 kilos. So it means that the uh, car, which is full of people, two-thirds of it is carrying itself. Actually, three, three quarters and only one quarter is passengers. Largest uh, truck in the world, it uh, can carry as much as it weighs itself. Buildings uh, use 90% uh, just to carry their own weight. Bridges 80%. So what if all materials uh, would become stronger? So let's say uh, double the strengths. You wouldn't need new materials. Uh, what we're lacking is uh, uh, strengths. We lack electrical conductivity, we lack uh, material properties. If we are able to change uh, the properties of materials, say by the factor of two, uh, we won't need new materials. 
and we wouldn't need additional energy because energy is uh, used to uh, produce these materials and uh, also to use transport which weighs too much. Let's have a look at all the materials in the world. This is the uh, main materials. It's just uh, taking calling main materials is something that uh, is produced in uh, volumes of more than one million tons per year and uh, which are produced uh, by significantly changing the chemical composition of the source material, the raw material. It's a, it's a very uh, interesting uh, fact. Uh, it, it w we've actually discovered it ourselves, we haven't found it anywhere in the literature. It's, a, it's very simple. This is a, the bottom scale is a vol production volume. This is one million tons per year. No, that's actually a thousand. Ten thousand, one million, one billion. And this is a price per kilogram. One dollar, ten hundred thousand. So it's, it's uh, amazing. But in a, on a logarithmic scale, they're all on a straight line. So, so what does that mean? It means that there is a correlation between them. It's a very simple fact. All materials com uh, compete with each other. So in construction, in transport, in packaging, any area of uh, human activity, uh, it makes the uh, materials compete. It's alloys of polymers, ceramics, paper. And the uh, production volumes, they're directly linked to the price and uh, in a linear fashion. If you want to, to make something 10 times cheaper, you need to produce 10 times as much of it. And uh, there is no other way. So 7 billion tons or 6 billion tons. So how can you change 6 billion tons of materials? Humanity doesn't have time or money uh, to pr uh, have the production capacities for another 6 billion tons. So let's assume that uh, you can uh, take a universal additive which we can add to all or almost all materials and change their properties, at least uh, doubling them. Let's assume it's possible. So what sort of additive should it be? So let's first of all uh, try to understand how much of it we need. Let's say 1%. And that means that uh, you need to uh, be able to produce at least 1 million tons of such additive. Because if you produce 100 different additives, then uh, based on this relationship, their price will uh, be economically unfeasible. What properties uh, should uh, this amazing additive have? First of all, and the most important property, it's first of all its uh, strengths. It should be different to what we know right now, at least by a fact, factor of 100. Because if you want to add 100 the uh, 100 spot and uh, uh, double the properties, you need it uh, to be 100 times stronger. So obviously, it should be a non-toxic substance. It should be uh, produced out of easily accessible uh, components. It should be ecologically safe. And you, sh and you should be able to make at least one million tons in the future. Not so long ago, graphene was discovered. Carbon, single wall carbon nanotubes, it's uh, basically graphene which is rolled into a tube. If carbon nanotubes uh, wouldn't be discovered in 91, but now, they would have been called uh, graphene tubes. 
two of these materials and, and only those materials, they have uh, almost all of uh, properties that uh, we have spoke about. They are hundred times uh, stronger than steel, and they're, but they are four times lighter. So their relative strength is 400 times better. The electric conductivity uh, is about the same as copper, but they are five, five times lighter. Uh, they are made out of carbon. All life uh, on the planet is made out of carbon. Because carbon is, uh, is an element which is uh, able to com combine itself with all other chemical elements. So it looks like there are hundreds and thousands of different uh, uh, publications which demonstrate that in small quantities, Carbon nanotubes and graphene nanotubes, it's talking about single wall nanotubes and calling them graphene nanotubes, they change properties of almost uh, all materials. Let's have a look at aluminium. Adding one tenth of a percent, so it's one thousand part by weight, makes aluminium as strong as steel, and it's a scientific fact. You can uh, read the tens and hundreds of publications on this matter. Generally speaking, you can say that uh, carbon nanotubes or graphene nanotubes are able to change 70 percent of all materials in the world, and that worldwide production currently is worth uh, three trillion dollars. It's a fact that uh, not invented by us, and uh, prove it to you. This is uh, international patents for uh, carbon nanotube applications. They were invent discovered in 1991. Four years ago, 8,000 patents like this existed. Less than four years after, almost 20,000. So more than 10,000 uh, patents over four years. That means thousands of international groups are working on creation uh, technologies. So why we are not surrounded by these products? In reality, they do exist. For example, out of uh, the top 10 in the last year's Tour de France, eight had uh, uh, bikes with uh, carbon nanotubes. But each bike, uh, carbon nanotubes in, e in each bike, they're worth about 5,000 euros. If you look at world, uh, worldwide carbon nanotubes production, uh, single world or graphene nanotubes, they're not produced uh, on industrial scale. The largest uh, producers are talking about volumes of about one ton per, per year. Uh, 8,000 hours in a year. So that means hundreds of, so of grams uh, per hour. It's uh, a device that could fit on this table. You, you can't uh, base uh, manufacturing around it. It's not uh, industrial manufacturing. Ten years ago, there was an attempt to scale it up, uh, but it didn't work out. There was a method that was invented, it's called a CCVD, but there were two issues. Uh, the product uh, produced by this method it wasn't a uh, single wall, but uh, multi wall nanotubes. So imagine that you take a cylinder and then you uh, put one of them into another one. So say 20, 20 layers. It's a multi wall nanotube. There was another issue. Uh, the method worked in such a way, this uh, CCVD method, it led to the fact that during synthesis, 
Tens of thousands of nanotubes got entangled into particles, uh, hundreds of microns in size. So imagine that you have particles out of 10,000 wires, 100 times uh, stronger than steel. So how can you untangle it? It's uh, not possible. And uh, nobody managed to do it. These two photographs are on the same scale. They demonstrate the most simple difference between single walled and multi walled nanotubes. So single walled nanotubes don't have this issue. And what's most important, they have the same effect uh, on a material in the concentrations uh, 100 times less and up to 10,000 times less. That means that you, uh, you need to add uh, single walled nanotubes during your techno technological process in, a, in such quantities that they will fully change it. So, so why uh, single walled nanotubes didn't take over the world? Because the typical price is hundred thousand dollars per kilo. They was hundred thousand times more than main polymers and the aluminium. Even if you add one tenth of a percent, it will still be hundred times more expensive than necessary. So nobody wants uh, uh, super aluminium, which is hundred times more expensive than your regular aluminium. Everything. I'm telling you sorry about a, such a long story. We understood it four years ago. And uh, we formulated an, ob an objective which, uh, and a problem which hasn't been solved by anyone at, at that time. We put up a goal to create a synthesis method of single walled carbon nanotubes. We wanted this method would uh, allow to scale uh, synthesis up to 1 million ton per year. So that the, uh, one of the most important properties would be that tubes would be <coughs> at least 100 times uh, cheaper than they are currently on the market. And we wanted uh, that the quality of uh, produced material would be such, with uh, such um, purity uh, as produced so that they could be used uh, in a technological process straight away without any lengthy process of separation or purification. We've spent 50 months and 50 million dollars on this. I'd like to uh, give the floor to Mikhail Pritechinsky. Uh, he's a physicist. He is a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He a, a very significant expert in uh, plasma physics and nanotechnologies. And what's important, 20 years ago he created a private institute which was creating technologies for largest technology companies in the world, such as H HP or Air Product and Chemicals. I'd like to ask Mikhail, the author of the technology and our partner, to tell you how he managed to solve this issue. So first of all, I'd like to thank our guests for coming here and uh, for, to listen to our results. And I'd uh, like to make my story less scientific and uh, make it as easy understand, to understand as possible. First of all, when we talk about synthesis of carbon nanotubes, we say that carbon nanotubes grow. And from that point of view, the uh, creation process is similar to how plants grow. So what do you need in order to grow a plant? You need a seed, you need heat or energy, 
and you need a substance from, from which a uh, plant will grow in this particular case it's CO2. CO2 through photosynthesis is uh, broken up in carbon and oxygen and the basis for a plant is carbon. And when we talk about carbon nanotubes, in physics, in physics there is even a term called forest of nanotubes. And on this picture you can see a nanotube which is, may not be uh, very much looking alike like a plant, but maybe something else, but we can say that this is a nano plant. The green ball it works like a seed, it's a nanoparticle, uh, it's a catalyst nanoparticle. In, in order for the tubes to grow, you also need heat, high temperature, a lot higher than for, for the plant, it's approximately 1000 degrees Celsius. And just like CO2 is needed for plants, you need a substance from which we will be able to produce the tubes. Usually it's hydrocarbon. At such high temperature, hydrocarbons, for example methane, is broken into carbon and uh, hydrogen. <coughs> and carbon is the main uh, substance for uh, carbon nanotube. When we put this objective to develop the technology for synthesis of such carbon nanotubes, it was a very ambitious objective, because over 20 years since the discovery of carbon nanotubes, uh, industrial production method was, hasn't been really invented, despite the fact that there were tens of different approaches were suggested for synthesis. At that time, my lab had a unique uh, plasma chemical reactor, which was invented by us. And there was an idea of how to use it uh, in order to produce uh, carbon nanotubes. And when we tried to use our generator, we pretty much got first carbon nanotubes uh, straight away. But then we had to spend four years to actually take our first experiments to technology level. So here schematically you can see how this plasma chemical reactor works. It's uh, using powerful arc discharge, hundreds of kilowatts. In. And this arc discharge is melting and uh, evaporating a surface of uh, metallic electrode, which is made out of uh, catalyst. When metal is evaporating, it's then condensing and you get uh, catalyst nanoparticles. But then you need to introduce hydrocarbons and under certain conditions you will obtain uh, carbon nanotubes. So now you'll see a fairly unique uh, video clip where you can see how this powerful arc is uh, evaporating the surface of the metal surface and these uh, green emissions they are actually uh, metal vapor and the ones that turn into uh, catalyst nanoparticles. The temperature inside the arc is around about five to seven thousand degrees. After we obtained first nanotubes, we've tried a few other different methods as for a catalyst nanoparticle synthesis as well as for the growth of nanotubes themselves. It was actually had to do with the fact that the plasma chemical reactors that you've seen uh, is uh, too powerful. You can't have it low powered. So we, we had too much catalyst and we didn't have the infrastructure to grow that many tubes so we couldn't use uh, all of the catalyst. So for example we used a smaller a plasma reactor, you can see it there, and the plasma arc there was evaporating not uh, a molten electrode but a solid electrode which was rotating and moving. And this allowed to uh, drastically decrease the power and do some lab research and uh, research the growth of nanotubes. 
professional. This is a method. fairly unique photo and a fairly unique method with demonstrating it for the first time. So this is actually the rotating electrode which is made out of catalyst and this is the arc discharge which you can see there which is evaporating it. At the end of the day we created such technology but before telling about its parameters I'll uh, I'll tell you about uh, peculiar uh, details of this technology, which is very useful. As he said before, in order to produce uh, nanotubes, you need hydrocarbon and you need heat. Then, after, as a result of the synthesis process, you get carbon nanotubes, as a bonus, you get hydrogen. If you burn this hydrogen, you once again get heat and you will actually get four times as much heat as you need to uh, synthesize nanotubes. Uh, don't be scared by this formula. A lot of uh, people think that it's, uh, energy preservation law is broken because in this technology we are actually burning methane, but we are not burning it completely. We only burn hydrogen and we use carbon as a material for pro producing nanotubes. In the real technology, the multiplier is of course not four, it's a bit less. But this schematics, they can demonstrate that uh, carbon nanotube synthesis technology can be treated as a green technology, which is very important in light of what Yuri was telling you about before. So, we created a technology and the most important parameter, parameter is a very high quality of the product. So, you can see the uh, packaged product here and the main parameter is uh, a quantity of nanotubes. Typically, uh, typical nanotubes that you can buy on the market as produced have uh, no more than 30% nanotubes. We get more than 75%. Of course, important uh, parameters of the technology is the scalability and the price of nanotubes, but uh, Yuri will tell you about this. Uh, in his uh, further presentation. We'll just uh, uh, wrap it up very quickly. So, uh, graphene nanotubes, they exist a whole lot of different methods uh, for their synthesis. And uh, the more content uh, of nanotubes you get as a result of your synthesis, the higher the price is. As Michael said, typically you get a purity of about 30 to 40 percent. Then there are purification and separation processes. So, for example, separated tubes, they uh, they're worth one million dollars per kilogram. We get a product uh, of this quality, around about 80 percent. Similar product currently costs about $100,000. And uh, we're going to a market with a price of $3,000. So 50 times cheaper. Uh, but the point is not this number. The point is not that it is 50. The point is that this price is the level at which uh, nanotubes are economically accessible for production of lithium-ion batteries, uh, car tires, composite materials, polymers, aluminium, and many others. Apart from uh, economic accessibility, most uh, important thing is uh, physical accessibility. All uh, production capacities in the world for carbon nanotube synthesis uh, amount to about 10 tons. Our current synthesis is reaching 2 tons, but uh, with existing reactor, next year we're able to produce uh, as much as uh, everything else in the world put together.
and our realistic plans is to, uh, by the year 2015, is to scale the production up to 1,000 tons per year. Is it a lot? Would like to remind you that the main applications, they work with one-tenth or one-hundredth of a percent. Same, with this scal uh, scalability, the price will uh, drop from $3,000 to $500 per kilogram. And uh, when you use them, so for example, for aluminium, which is worth about $2 per kilogram, its, its properties, uh, its price will increase by uh, tens of cents. Five hundred kilograms of nanotubes <coughs> is sufficient for all touch touch screens in the world uh, to become twenty times cheaper. And the current, in order to change all lithium ion batteries in the world, you need to produce just one hundred and fifty tons for all. Uh, uh, carbon fibers, and it's uh, aviation and uh, wind uh, energy generation and uh, sports goods, 300 tons is sufficient. 25,000 tons is enough to change uh, all tires in the world. Uh, we think that uh, economic demand and uh, the necessity for carbon nanotubes will lead to the fact that by uh, 2025 there will be no less than 145,000 tons of carbon nanotubes produced and uh, this production scale and decreases in price will uh, allow for carbon nanotubes to be used in construction materials. It's a market uh, 70 billion dollars in size which currently is less than 200 million. And uh, our plan is to take up no less than 75% of this market. It's uh, in case if we can't hold on to 95% market share, which we're going to start with. Currently, we're developing uh, real-life products. Uh, they at advanced stages of development with 42 partners in uh, 17 countries. But our plan is to, within 10 days of this presentation, for, uh, to all the companies we've identified and to all the contacts we've identified, and we picked the companies whose products can be immediately, uh, or basically over the course of one year, can be changed, and they will uh, get a completely different market properties. We will send out letters and samples, so that we can uh, tell the uh, nanotechnologies uh, community about that this type of material is uh, accessible. This is a sample pack. This is uh, our material. It's uh, one gram. It's enough to run any scientific tests and a small trial. Today it's uh, worth about 150 to 300 dollars. We are providing it to absolutely everyone for free. So I'd like to uh, introduce Ashot Teravanesov. One more time, he is uh, running our London office. Everybody who is interested in getting such a sample, you can uh, take it for free. The material is here in, uh, in warehouse in London. In conclusion, i uh, tell you very quickly how we see the development of the market. We think that the key event is the creation of a scalable uh, synthesis technology for graphene nanotubes. Uh, and it happened. The first products on the market will be lithium ion batteries. They will uh, appear this year, and you will see them uh, at the exhibitions, you will see real batteries.
Следующий продукт это композитные материалы. Next uh, product is composite materials. Как я уже сказал, супер спортивные. They already Сейчас said it's конечно, a super, super sports bikes. They already contain carbon nanotubes. Только они стоят 5000 евро на один. Сейчас they're worth 5000 euro per bike. Наших у вас продукта надо uh, на 50 you евро. You would need 50 euro worth of our product. То есть любой велосипед. So any bike может содержать этот продукт. Uh, could have this product in it. Это приведет к and it will lead to probably reducing uh, the weight of sports bike by a factor of two. Next goal is tires. We've created and we are testing them. And this year there will be first trial uh, sample which will be then tried in real life. Then thermoplastics. It's a much uh, bigger volume production. It requires more material at a cheaper price. Uh, all of this together will allow you to create almost all uh, automotive components. If you look at hybrid cars, especially at electric cars, there is not a single part in this car that cannot be radically changed uh, with graphene nanotubes. Uh, the result, it will be half the weight and it will use four times less energy. Why four times less, not two? Because it has to do with uh, battery properties and with the ability to uh, recuperate energy. And finally, uh, new airplanes. Maybe not all of you know, but in March this year, Airbus they launched the first uh, electrical plane. It's recommending it very much to have a look at that clip on YouTube. But uh, it had the biggest impression on Yuri. And uh, with further scale-ups and uh, further reductions in price, this material uh, will be uh, used in construction material and will be used in real construction. Uh, our estimates for this market, 1.5 trillion dollars by year 2025. It's a cautious focused, analytic, analytical focused. It's uh, done on a sector by sector basis with the real uh, penetration rates with uh, taking into account how much time it takes to do the trials and certifications. It's a focus that he's uh, con uh, sure about. Uh, it's, uh, it's a low end estimate. We call this alter material revolution because what we mean is alter is changing, it's transforming materials and uh, giving them new properties. I'd like to show you a video.
9 мая завтра. Series of May is a date. Весь буддийский мир празднует. The whole Buddhist world is celebrating a date called Vesak. Это день, в который родился. It's a day. It's a birthday of Buddha. Buddha. Прозрел. When he became enlightened. И ушел в Нирвану. And when he went into Nirvana. Когда он прозрел. When he got enlightened. Он семь дней молчал. He was he was silent for seven days. Потому что он не знал. Because he didn't know how to tell people the truth that he understood. And then seven days after, he started talking, and his first words was a phrase: "The truth that has been spoken about becomes a lie." It's very hard to actually make you understand something that we completely believe into. But I'm hoping that in the answers to your questions, and I'm hoping that they will be there. And when you look at the exposition, we will be able to make you understand what we believe in and what we understand. Once again, thank you very much for coming. Michael Lukin, Cambridge Technology Innovations. Um, my question is, uh, question is related to the safety of uh, carbon nanotubes. I'm probably ignorant in this area, but um, uh, I do. I am aware that uh, some nanoparticles are, uh, do um, have some uh, hazard uh, for uh, humans and so on. So some protection is required. But uh, on the video, I saw no protection for, for the workers. So I was wondering how. Um, safe it is. About safety is uh, made out of three parts. So start from the bottom and then go up. The question about safety, or how safe and how unsafe are they? Strictly speaking, it hasn't been uh, resolved yet. There aren't any uh, conclusive evidence uh, that they are unsafe. Uh, despite the fact uh, that this uh, research has been done for more than 15 years. In itself, uh, it's a fairly significant result because if it would have been very unsafe, and probably over 15 years uh, these facts would have, uh, would have been proven. The bodies which are responsible for regulating safety in USA, they treat this material as in the lowest category. For example, a typical salt is in the same category. And strictly speaking, in order to work with these materials, you don't need anything apart from protecting your breathing. At the same time, from the very beginning, we were very concerned about the production safety, and the production is implemented with the safest possible methods, because it's fully, uh, it's fully sealed. That's first of all. Secondly, as he already told you, uh, carbon nanotubes are used as additive. So, same societies in US, they came to the conclusion that uh, carbon nanotubes which are built into matrices, uh, they are safe. And they, even when you ask, uh, scratch the surface, they can't uh, be emitted. If, for example, you make a plastic toy with carbon nanotubes, uh, it, you will be allowed to sell it in the US. And then finally, uh, as a biologist by education, I can tell you that um, what uh, living forms uh, counted with during their evolution, 
Они вырабатывают механизмы защиты от этих факторов. Углеродные нанотрубки выделяются практически в любом процессе. В лесных пожарах. Если вы возьмете в своем камине, Something in, uh, if you look at the walls in your fireplace, and uh, you look at, uh, and uh, you take a swab and you make, uh, you, sorry, you take a picture with an electronic microscope. Uh, I can tell you right now that you will find the carbon nanotubes there. Поэтому мы считаем это So we think it's uh, it's a safe uh, production method. And, uh, it's uh, completely safe as far as applications are concerned. Uh, I can draw your attention to, to the fact that there are about 25 million tons of rubber produced in the world. And uh, for that synthesis uh, of 11 million tons of, of carbon black is used. It's nanoparticles. Uh, 10 nanometers in size. Uh, this manufacturing existed for over 100 years. Uh, it's everywhere in the world, in Europe, in the US. And uh, we uh, were particularly interested in it. In, in this area, there are no uh, specific uh, occupational uh, hazards in, and um, sicknesses. But once again, uh, we are thinking about it and we are taking all uh, possible measures uh, just in case. Uh, thank you very much for your exciting presentation. And, uh, can you explain to us uh, how strong is your patent protection? Because this looks like a really big thing. And uh, uh, what's your forecast? when? Your technology will be copied. <laughs> As you said, investors uh, put a lot of uh, and quite significant amounts of money into this technology, and uh, we're constantly thinking about uh, the protection. We probably have almost uh, 10,000, uh, sorry, 10 patent applications. We have a fundamental patent. And we also understand that uh, probably knows one example that uh, you already spoke about. It's uh, Zynga. They created a patent which nobody was uh, able to overcome. We understand in some reasonable time frames technologies will appear of a similar level, maybe at a higher level, yeah, just like the ones that we created. So we understand that we have a window in time and during this window we will be either able to realize our commercial ambitions or we won't have enough time to do that. And we think it's around about five years. So just would like to add something to that. We obtained a fundamental patent uh, for the principle, for the method, and for the device in the US. Currently, we have 12 international patents and applications. So, uh, Mikhail told you about the fundamental nature. Because we're actually patenting some fundamental properties. And, uh, uh, the fact that there are uh, free-floating uh, uh, nanoparticles. It, it's uh, flying through the gas and uh, carbon nanotubes is growing off it. So this differentiates us from everyone else. We managed to get a US patent without disclosing uh, important uh, details about the device itself. So it's a significant uh, know-how. 
которым мы чрезвычайно осторожно и тщательно обращаемся. Я также должен сказать, что мы юридически сразу были созданы как люксембургская компания. We were uh, created in Luxembourg and incorporated in Luxembourg. It was uh, done specifically uh, from the point of view of uh, IP protection. So, uh, trust me, we spend, put a lot of attention on that. Mustafa Bayazid from Imperial College London. Uh, recently, new technologies appeared in graphene science as well. And this is basically, you know, the depend on the nanotube science. So, how you are planning to, you know, to compete with that, you know, the emerging graphene science technologies in future? You have some expectations, you know, the, uh, around 2015 or 2025. But I'm sure that graphene technologies will, you know, the come up with, you know, the, the new technologies as well, and new, you know, the methods will be produced to produce more graphene and more graphene. So, how you will compete with those technologies? in near future or far future. Uh, you're absolutely right. Graphene is a, a very, um, very important material and it's difficult to say what will happen in 25 years uh, as far as competition between nanotubes and graphene is concerned. But one thing that can be said is that uh, if we look at how newly discovered materials are used, typically you need uh, around about 20 years from the time it is discovered till it's uh, used widely. You can see it based uh, on examples such as uh, Teflon, Capron and other new materials. For nanotubes, uh, it, 20 years have just gone by. So what happened over these 20 years? First of all, there was a huge raise in uh, interest. Last year, due to the issues that Yuri was talking about, large companies like Shodan and Bayer, they closed down their manufacturing facilities for multi-wall nanotubes, and it was uh, it, it made a lot of impression on investors, but currently it's, easy, it's now understood that actual single-walled nanotubes, uh, it's an, and there is a growth of interest again, so typically the graph reaches its maximum, then it drops down, and then if it's, uh, you get lucky, it then shoots up again. We think that we are in uh, the beginning of the growth. Possibly uh, the same thing will happen to graphene, with a high probability, it's probably still 10 years uh, in the future, and we are hoping that we have sufficient now. Yuri will correct uh, if anything. So uh, Mikhail is absolutely right, but he'd like to add something to this. So what does it mean that there hasn't been an, uh, enough time for graphene? So how many patents exist uh, for graphene applications? Less than 3,000. Uh, nanotubes is 20,000. Uh, for, many, for many applications and in many conferences, we see people who say that this technology is better with graphene. Somebody says this technology is better with nanotubes. It's their real competitors. So far, the way we see it and understand it, uh, as of today, uh, nanotubes are winning. But possibly it won't be like this for forever. There's one uh, important thing about our technology. Uh, there are particular operating conditions in our reactors under which uh, pure graphene can be synthesized. So we can do it that are cheaper than anyone else in the world. And we, work, we, have, we are working in this area, and, but we are uh, leaving them till the future. It's a real issue, it's a real collision, and most likely these two materials 
разные. Это две близкие области одного и того. The two fairly close areas of the same. Я вполне допускаю, что, например, тачскрины. Assuming that, for example, fully allowing for the possibility that transparent electrodes or touchscreens in the future, graphene will take that market. Но вряд ли это произойдет, например, с шинами или пластиками. But it's unlikely it will happen with tires or with plastics. Хотя, конечно, никто не знает истину. Although nobody knows what will happen. Ron Freeman, Private Investor Group. Can you clarify the current investors? competitors and customers the company has? And competitors and companies that are still existing. The easiest is the investors. First of all, it's four founders of the company. It's Mikhail, Yuri Oleg and him. And we own almost 70% of the company still. We have one we have one big investor. It's a Rosnano subsidiary, which owns 19.5% of the company. And then there is another well-known Russian businessman, Igor Kim, which also invested about $10 million into this company. So this is investors, competitors, it wouldn't go too far to say that the biggest competitor is the fact that we haven't done something. Second largest competitor. Это не желание больших компаний, производящих материалы. Fact that there is no desire with the large material producing companies to change their technology processes and to do some research in the areas of new technology. Классического прямого конкурента. The classic direct competitor. With a similar product, similar method, and similar economic parameters, currently they don't exist, or we don't know about it. We very carefully research in this subject. I can't discount the fact that somewhere in the lab, the method has already been created, which is as good as ours, but it's not known at the moment. Our clients, today we are concentrating in three different application areas we think the first market products will appear. It's lithium-ion batteries, it's tires and rubber and composites. It's a classic or carbon fiber or fiberglass and composites based around thermoplastics. We are most advanced in the area of batteries. Currently, we've tested our products and we have some results back. Roughly with 10 different large companies, including the number one in the area of batteries. I can't tell you the names because we have NDAs, but it's a large industrial company which is using our materials in their real technological process. In the area of tires, working with the Russian company, it's a subsidiary of Tatneft. It's called Nizhnikamsky Tire Factory. It's a subsidiary company is producing approximately 1 billion euros worth of tires per year. It's approximately 65% of all the tires produced in Russia. Most of the tires go to assembly lines in Russia for manufacturers such as Ford and Volkswagen.
Мы совместно начали с ними два с половиной года назад. We've uh, started working with them uh, two and a half years ago. Они точно сформулировали продукт, который им нужен. They have uh, very, uh, defined exactly what sort of product they need. Это было связано с введением в Европе had... нового... With the... It had to do with the, the new uh, markings for tires were introduced in Europe, which have to disclose their uh, true properties. So created a, a new tire like this. It's a real tire with an inner tube is uh, there on the, in the exposition. And they've been uh, tested in, uh, in Spain. But this year uh, we should be producing about 1,000 of them. And after trials, a decision will be made for it to go into production or not. Uh, altogether, they are producing 15 million tires. You need 15 tons of nanotubes for this. So even one-fifth of their volumes is uh, getting us close to break-even. We are working with uh, um, world, uh, worldwide companies in the areas of uh, tire manufacturing, uh, somebody out of top four, also can't tell you the name, but uh, everything is moving very slowly there, but every uh, the step has a very good uh, outcomes. Probably won't uh, go to a product stage uh, anywhere sooner than three years. In the area of carbon fibers, uh, we're working with a company called Zyvex in the US very closely. It's the first uh, nanotechnology uh, company in the US created specifically for nanotechnologies. We have a uh, very deep involvement with them. We're working with all Zyvex clients. And it's actually them who are producing uh, materials for sports bikes. And there is a very uh, serious project in the area of car manufacturing. And we're talking about 2016. If this product happens, it will be just huge. In the area of thermoplastics, we're working with European manufacturers. It's a private company. They're, supp they're supplying their parts to uh, car manufacturers. And also with the two large Russian companies. It's a Kazan Synthes. And, and Sibur. We're working with the polyethylene and polypropylene. Generally speaking, our business model uh, to start with looks like a uh, falling. We de definitely know that nanotubes change almost uh, every material. It's pointless to run uh, experiments and to repeat something that was already done a hundred times. We need a partner which definitely want to change, partner who understands what sort of product they want, what sort of properties it should have, and have sufficient R&D uh, department to allow us to work together. In that case, we will be able to move together very quickly. We get results quickly. What happened with tires and with lithium-ion batteries? So currently, in the audience, we have a representative from a German company called Taranis. We're working together on batteries. But in all cases, uh, the idea is, so you have a factory, it's producing something, tires, a polymers, or pipe, polymer pipes, or lithium-ion batteries, it was worth 100 million euros or maybe more, and it's producing something, and uh, you're already on the market. We're offering you a solution when you are not making any new investments, you don't buy any additional equipment, you just take an additive, 
в первую технологическую стадию and просто добавляешь. You introduce it in the first stage of your technological process. И настраивая процесс, and не by меняя, adjusting, а uh, not changing the process, вы получаете продукт, you get a product, который на десятки процентов, а иногда в разы, by a factor of actually a few times different uh, to what you are currently producing. It's uh, very economically effective for the partner. It's very quick um, and it's very easy to understand. We have trial this model over 10 times now and it works in the US and in Europe and in Russia. I don't know if you have a question. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.